Welcome, dear friends, to the service for Sunday, the 4th of August. And I do pray that you will all be truly blessed as we share in this time together. The Lord be with you. Praise the Lord. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, 
Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So let us confess our sins, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with our neighbor. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon our sins and set us free from them, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading comes from 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 26 to chapter 12 verse 13a. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite 
to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 51 Have mercy on me, O God, in your enduring goodness, according to the fullness of your compassion. Blot out my offenses. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my rebellion, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your eyes, so you will be just in your sentence and blameless in your judging. Surely in wickedness I was brought to birth, and in sin my mother conceived me. You that desire truth in the inward parts, or teach me wisdom in the secret places of the heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear of joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me out from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. O oh, give me the gladness of your help again, and support me with a willing spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This morning's reading comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, starting at verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope. When you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father for all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given to Christ as apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is, very, is the very one who ascended higher than all heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and the craftiness of people in the deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord.
Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, beginning to read at the 24th verse. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed a seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the Gospel of Christ. There's something about bread and its ability to satisfy you. And it's not just the, the delicious smell when it's baking. And it's not just a full belly. It's that sense of security and comfort that comes from the smell of warm bread and the fullness of the soul. There's something about a piece of warm bread that satisfies the heart of a person. Maybe that's why Jesus said what he did to the crowd who had gathered around that day some, th some 2,000 years ago. Jesus had come to them with compassion and healed their sick. After a day filled with people, he took a little boy's lunch of five loaves and two fish blessed it and broke it, and then fed the crowd of 5,000. As someone familiar with how our Bible stories end, I'm sometimes impatient with the crowd chasing after Jesus. How can people bother Jesus for another round of loaves of and fish when Jesus is going to serve up his very life on a cross to draw all people to himself and take away our sin and the sin of the world? With Jesus, I find myself thinking, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, with the Son of humanity, which the Son of Humanity will give you. And that's from John 6, verses 27. Then I contemplate the story through the realities of our world. As long lines for humanitarian aid demonstrate, eating your full one day does not mean that you'll be, not be hungry the next. When there is no food, and you do not know how you will sustain your life today, what is the point of working for eternity? Think of parents whisking their children out of their beds in Gaza or Central Africa on the promise of a better life, only to watch their kids starve to death or get blown to bits in the desert. Some things are worth complaining to God about. Sometimes asking God for assurance that God is still with us is understandable, even appropriate. When Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. I don't think Jesus was scolding the crowd for seeking bread because they were hungry. I think Jesus was disappointed that the crowd did not expect more. Not more bread, but something more. Perhaps Jesus was thinking more about ending hunger than serving up more bread. Moses and Aaron, not to mention God, may have been disappointed that Israel did not expect more. Not an Egyptian deli in the desert, but that the God who delivered them from slavery would also sustain them in the desert. This is easy to see and even easier to say because we know the, the end of God's story for us and for the world as well as for the people in the world. Manna, quail, promised land. 
suffering, death, resurrection, water, word, table, abundance and eternal life. So why don't we expect more from God? Why do we settle for signs of God's grace, bread from whatever source, rather than seeking and expecting God's immortal love for us? Could it be that we work for the food that perishes, rather than the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Humanity gives us, because we are unwilling or unable to name what we truly hunger for and seek? Why do you suppose this is? Fear of being disappointed? A need to somehow protect God? And clarity that we are not deserving all come to mind. And why do we assume that we have to work to get what we truly hunger for and seek? With the crowd, we assume that the key question when God, when we encounter God is from John 6, 28, what must we do to perform the works of God? Along with how much is enough and how do we make sure we do it right? These questions press even harder when the stakes are war and peace, safety and security, food, water and health care, the economy and the environment. What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus responds to us as he did the crowd. In John 6, 29 we read, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom God has sent. To believe is to trust that God is doing something new, that human created conditions and circumstances cannot undermine or negate. To believe is to submit everything, even our highest stake issues, to God's saving work in Jesus. To believe is not so much what we do as being open to what God is doing. Of course, being open to what God is doing and submitting everything to Jesus means we might not do what is wise, practical, advantageous, safe. In fact, being open to God and submitting everything to Jesus means that our doing is less important because we are not in charge, let alone in control. Now, if we're going to give up all control, we need some assurance, some guarantee. Perhaps we can understand the crowd crowd asking, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? Since the crowd is looking for a political king like David and a prophet like Moses, what better sign than manna in the wilderness? Moses gave manna to their ancestors and their ancestors believed. But Jesus points out that God, rather than Moses, fed the people in the wilderness. What made the feeding of a sign was not the manna, But the manna came down from heaven. The manna was only an appetizer for the true bread that came down from heaven. Jesus, who gives life through his teaching and his flesh, because God sent Jesus. Jesus is the bread that fulfills all our hunger and thirst. Jesus frees us to follow him, not to achieve self-satisfaction, not to get anything that is in it for us, not even to attain or maintain peace of mind. Jesus frees us to embrace God's redeeming will to restore the cosmos to what God created and humanity to what God intends. Such faith does not mean separating the spiritual out of the social. It means putting God rather than us at the center of both. When we do, we can and will expect more. Shalom. Let us pray. We worship you, O God, with songs of praise. We worship you with words of prayer and with ears that listen for you to speak your saving truth into our lives. We worship you in the silent spaces where we struggle for hope and for courage. We long for a glimpse of your glory, the glory that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. The glory that touches lives with a beauty so holy that it heals the wounded soul. 
the glory that gives strength to the weary. We who stumble and fall so often worship you, longing for your light to shine upon us. Dazzle us with your holy love. Draw us into your purifying presence. Speak to us your transforming truth. Then grant us grace to live every moment changed by such glory, daring to live with hope and courage and love, reflecting the life of Jesus, through whom your glory shines in the most unexpected ways. Through the the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We come now to the celebration of the Sacrament of the Holy Eucharist.